Today we're going to be discussing a general overview of anatomy, kinesiology, and biomechanics for the foot and ankle. As we get started, just a quick reminder that this does contain fair use material and falls under the Fair Use Act disclaimer, meaning that this material is for educational purposes only. The references for the information that is presented on the following slides can be found in these texts, overviewing orthopedic, kinesiology, anatomy, and clinical examination. So as we begin with our overview of the foot and ankle, we have to first recognize two concepts. First, the foot and ankle has to provide enough mobility to adapt to varying surfaces, in essence a mold to uneven or variable terrain, to attenuate shock, absorb it and dissipate it, and then finally to act as a rigid lever during the push-off phase of gait. As such, it also has to provide enough stability for effective locomotion. <clears throat> and so we have to hold these two concepts in tension with each other. It really is almost kind of a paradox of how in the world does a region have lots of mobility while also providing lots of stability. What complicates things all the more is through this complex we have 28 bones composed of the tarsals, we have two sesamoid bones on the plantar aspect of the first ray, there's 27 articulations and over 100 ligaments contributing to the static stability of the foot and ankle. <clears throat> The ankle and foot are divided into a couple of regions. First we find the hind foot. This region is composed of the talus and the calcaneus and its function is to influence the function of the mid and forefoot. Under normal gait circumstances uh, initial contact is going to occur in the hind foot and then progress into the midfoot and forefoot through loading response and the stance phase of gait. As we look at the midfoot here we find the navicular all three of our cuneiforms and the cuboid. The function of this region is to assist in the formation of the transverse arch as well as to assist in forming a midfoot lever that will transmit the forces that are incurred at the hind foot at initial contact to the forefoot and in essence then assisting with this concept of stability. Finally we come to the forefoot. Here we have our five metatarsals our 14 phalanges as well as the medial and lateral sesamoids. And here the function is really to adapt to uneven terrain or variable terrain and to adjust to uneven surfaces. There is a good amount of mobility uh, that is present within the forefoot and there's also a good amount of stability and the stability assists us in balance and accommodating for dynamic proprioceptive neuromuscular control. If we visually kind of break these down, here's a nice image from Netter that shows this division both from the lateral side and the medial side. We can visualize here the trochlea of the superior talus. We can also see the body and uh, the, the hind foot portion of the calcaneus. As we move more distally, we can see the transverse tarsal joint separating the hind foot from the midfoot. Here we find our navicular, our cuneiforms, and our cuboid before progressing all the way to the forefoot where we find our metatarsals and phalanges. Again, you can appreciate the variance here from the lateral side and the medial side. Things to be mindful of would be the uh, tuberosity of the fifth metatarsal bone or the metatarsal head. That's a very um, a palpable landmark on the lateral side of the foot and ankle. Um, as we move to the medial side we can see things uh, like the sustentaculum tali as well as the navicular tuberosity which is another uh, very important clinical landmark uh, when we are performing palpation. Um, we can also visualize the first ray where we begin to appreciate the medial and lateral sesamoid bone that's found on that plantar or inferior aspect. It's also helpful to recognize some of the different joints that make up the foot and ankle. If we look at the uh, Taylor curl joint, um, initially we see uh, more of a plane uh, type uh, 
or excuse me, uh, if we look at the, the, the subtalar joint, we let's start there. Uh, if we look at the subtalar joint, we see more of a hinge uh, type joint here. Um, the talocrural joint um, uh, would also be considered more of a hinge joint. Um, as we move on to the right side of your screen, we visualize the metatarsal phalangeal joint. These are considered condyloid joints. Um, and so we'll kind of follow more of a convex, concave uh, uh, principle, but with 360 degrees of freedom. And then finally, as we move into the subtalar, uh, uh, the talo uh, calcaneo navicular, uh, the transverse tarsals, tarsum metatarsals, these are considered uh, plane type joints. And so um, hopefully this this graphic uh, with some of the illustrations in gray gives you an appreciation for how uh, the mechanics of these various joints may interact. Additionally, it is helpful to engage in discussion of load that is being incurred about the foot and ankle. During normal gait, uh, which would be illustrated on the right-hand side of your screen with the dotted lines, uh, this would be walking, peak vertical forces through the foot and ankle are somewhere around 120% of body weight. Um, when we look at running, the peak vertical forces go up considerably. Uh, it could be as high as 275% as body weight, or higher, um, depending on the speed. Uh, when we when we think of uh, an individual who is running at a very fast uh, rate of speed or, or even sprinting, um, this could be in excess of eight to ten times body weight in terms of peak vertical force and ground reaction force. If we look at the hind foot, approximately two thirds or 60% of the load is carried by the hind foot, with the remaining third or 28% uh, of the weight bearing carried through the forefoot and the metatarsal heads. When we look at this in terms of ankle load, the attenuation of load, assuming an individual is about 180 pounds, um, utilizing these per peak vertical forces, uh, we can anticipate that over a one mile walk, uh, an individual will have to attenuate somewhere around 76.2 tons of load per foot. And for a one mile run, somewhere around 121.5 tons of load per foot. So you can start to appreciate how much load is being uh, not only experienced, but then attenuated, meaning dissipated and managed by the foot and ankle complex. As we begin our discussion of the joints, the first one that we'll discuss is the distal uh, tibiofibular joint or tib-fib joint. This is a joint that is tightly bound uh, to the, the tibia uh, and fibula. Uh, we have several ligaments that, that hold this together. Uh, in the image on the right hand side of your screen, you can see some of these. Um, not only do you have the interosseous membrane that exists uh, in between uh, the two long bones, but then you also have an anterior and posterior uh, tibiofibular ligament that helps to really kind of bind this. And um, it's classified then as a syndesmosis. And so the motions are, it acts as a syndesmosis. Distally, there's one millimeter that's covered with hyaline cartilage. So it's really not built for a lot of movement like we would see in other joints. Um, rather, it is there to provide stability. Um, and uh, this distal tib-fib joint, as we look to the fibular side, this is where we would find our lateral uh, malleoli. On the medial side, we would find the medial malleoli or the tibial side. Uh, the tibia is concave, the fibula seems to have more of a convex planar uh, type motion, and so it does allow for some sliding rotational movement between the two bones. Uh, the open pack position would be in plantar flexion, the closed pack position would be in maximum dorsiflexion. And this, uh, this degree of sliding and rotating is necessary uh, for full range of motion both between plantar flexion and dorsiflexion, and oftentimes when we see a dorsiflexion restriction, uh, we may consider uh, providing a mobilization strategy uh, to the distal tib-fib joint in order to improve uh, end-range uh, dorsiflexion. 
The next joint that we're going to talk about is the talocrural joint. Um, here we find the tibiotalar articulation as well as the talofibular articulation. And the talocrural joint uh, is commonly referred to and thought of as a mortise. So what do we mean by mortise? Well, on the right-hand side of your screen, you can see uh, this concept that's that's known as a, a mortise and a tenon. This is commonly used in woodworking, but in essence, uh, the tenon fits very, very snugly within the mortise, which is a hollowed out region. Um, in this case, uh, the Taylor dome uh, would be the tenon. The mortise would be made up by the distal tib fib joint. And so the Taylor curl joint as a whole then is, is thought of as a mortise. The motions that exist here are plantar flexion and dorsiflexion primarily. As such, the open pack position is somewhere between um, uh, inversion and eversion, but in about 10 degrees of plantar flexion. So this is a mid-range position uh, where we would anticipate the open pack position to be. Closed pack position would be maximum dorsiflexion. And then the capsular pattern is limitations in both plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. To illustrate the range of motion of the Taylor curl joint, this is a helpful figure from Newman's second edition. Uh, we can see the neutral position where the foot is in just a slight degree of plantar flexion. Um, as we move into dorsiflexion, there is a degree of pronation that occurs. As we move into plantar flexion, there is a degree of supination that occurs. And the reason for that is we have not only a vertical axis and an anterior to posterior axis, but then we also have this medial lateral axis. And so we will get some component or combined motion into both pronation and supination as we move through more of a planar motion, that being dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Newman also provides a helpful graphic in terms of understanding the arthrokinematics of the Taylor curl joint. So as the foot would move into open chain dorsiflexion, there would be a posterior glide or slide and an anterior roll. As this occurs, the anterior capsule is placed on slack, uh, specifically through the anterior talofibular ligament, whereas the posterior capsule would be placed on more of a stretch. As we go into plantar flexion, the posterior capsule now is placed on more of a slack. Uh, with plantar flexion, we uh, result in a posterior roll and an anterior glide and slide. So as we consider where we'll go with regards to objective examination and ultimately intervention where we're applying our mobilization strategies, um, it's helpful to recognize what are the component motions that are occurring at the Taylor curl joint and how might we not only assess them, but also treat them by providing a mobilized intervention. Finally, we look at the last uh, image here, which shows closed chain dorsiflexion, meaning the distal uh, segment would be fixed. What's helpful here is we can see some of the uh, surrounding uh, soft tissue that would play a role here to include the Achilles tendon, the calcaneofibular ligament, as well as fibularis longus. Um, this also shows kind of this rectilinear path of the tibia uh, as we move into full dorsiflexion, recognizing again that it is not a straight linear path. All right, and so the reason why this is important is if we are to gain full dorsiflexion and full plantar flexion, we have to restore not only the rectilinear path of the tibia, but we also have to account for supination and pronation. As we continue to look at the joints of the ankle and foot, um, looking at the talocrural joint, we find our medial collateral ligament. This is also referred to as the deltoid ligament of the ankle. And this is one of the big reasons um, why we do not see a lot of uh, medial ankle sprains. Um, there are some morphological differences or uh, orientations that also prevent the ankle from uh, rolling into a degree of eversion and therefore incurring a medial ankle sprain. But the deltoid ligament is a really, really big broad ligament on that medial aspect of the foot and ankle. And so if we look at kind of the four main components, um, the first ligament that we encounter uh, in kind of our progression here, it's actually going to be labeled number four. This is probably one of the bigger uh, ligaments in terms of overall area. And this is the tibio-navicular ligament. Now what's really nice about these ligaments is they are named for that which they connect. And so the tibio-navicular ligament runs from the tibia to the navicular. 
and this is a significant limiter to eversion of the hind foot and so it limits inward displacement of the head of the talus which is its more proximal or excuse me uh, which is um, going to result in Taylor horizontal adduction during closed chain pronation Additionally, it limits plantar flexion of the navicular. Um, as, as the foot and ankle goes into a plantar flex position, those ligamentous fibers are going to go on stretch and it would limit the degree of translation. The second broadest, uh, biggest uh, ligament that we see is the tibiocalcaneal ligament. Again, name for where it goes. So it goes from that medial uh, malleoli of the tibia down to the sustentaculum talus of the calcaneus, and it too limits eversion of the rear foot. Finally, then we have two ligaments, the tibiotalar ligaments. On the anterior side, we have the anterior tibiotalar ligament. This also limits eversion. All four of these are going to limit eversion, but this is going to limit plantar flexion of the talus. In contrast, the posterior tibiotalar ligament, which also runs from the tibia, tibia down to the talus, in this case, um, it's going to go to the posterior process of the talus. Uh, here we see that it also limits eversion, but now it's going to limit dorsiflexion of the talus. So in essence, the posterior and anterior tibiotalar ligaments um, kind of serve opposing uh, motion restrictions, uh, that being dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. We also have lateral counterparts, and the lateral counterparts are the ligaments that are oftentimes implicated uh, when an individual has incurred a lateral ankle sprain. And so uh, these ligaments are going to be crucial for us to recognize because these are part of a grading system that we will discuss when we get to objective exam as well as differential diagnosis and that is the West Point ankle uh, grading system. And so the degree of ankle sprain, we might say a grade one, a grade two, or grade three, depends on whether or not these three ligaments have been um, implicated. And so the first ligament that we'll look at is labeled one, it's in red, it's the anterior talofibular ligament, also referred to as the ATFL. It limits not only anterior displacement of the talus, but also rear foot inversion. And note that uh, limiting the lateral displacement of the head of the talus, um, this would be an example of Taylor horizontal abduction. Okay, it also is going to limit plantar flexion of the talus, and this is typically one of the first ones uh, to go in terms of ankle pathology with a lateral inversion ankle sprain. Second ligament that we're going to look at is the CFL. The CFL is the calcaneofibular ligament. By the way, you'll notice these are named just the exact same way as our medial ligaments are, so this is going to run from the calcaneus to the fibula. Okay. Um, and this is going to limit uh, rear foot uh, inversion as well as dorsiflexion. All right. Uh, next, we have our posterior talofibular ligament, and this is the PTFL. This limits posterior displacement of the talus as well as limiting dorsiflexion. So you'll note that the CFL and the PTFL both limit dorsiflexion, the ATFL limits plantar flexion. All right. Um, all three of these, though, serve to limit inversion with PTFL also limiting the posterior displacement of the talus. If we look now at the joints um, from uh, the next step down, so we started with Taylor curl, now we're moving down to the subtalar joint. We recognize that the subtalar joint is a two joint complex. Uh, and so it's also referred to as the talocalcaneal joint. The anterior joint is formed by anterior and medial facets of the calcaneus that then corresponds to the facets of the talus. The posterior joint consists of more of a convex shaped facet on the calcaneus that corresponds to a concave facet on the talus. And so the calcaneus and the talus, they, they interact together both anteriorly and posteriorly. This relationship is thought to set up a really complex, almost like screw-like movement. You can think of it as kind of being analogous to the screw home mechanism that we see in the knee that occurs during subtalar joint motion. And so uh, 
one of the reasons why the subtalar joint gets a lot of attention is because of this kind of complex movement. It's occurring during supination and pronation, and one of the things that we oftentimes uh, want to control when we're discussing matters of gait or stance stability is this degree of pronation and supination. Should be noted that the joint cavity is continuous then with the talonavicular joint um, as well as then the talocalcaneal joint. So these two are a continuous joint space. The open pack position is in a mid-range position, somewhere between supination and pronation. Closed packed, where we would find maximal congruency, is in a supinated position. If we look at this, um, utilizing uh, an appreciation of the AP axis as well as uh, more of a medial lateral axis, we can begin to appreciate kind of this neutral position. Um, with pronation, uh, the main components are going to be eversion and abduction. Abduction um, occurring here along with eversion. Okay, and so same as we've discussed earlier, abduction is moving away from midline of the body. It would be defined here as hind foot abduction. As we move into supination, um, we would see inversion and a deduction. So again, moving towards midline, this would be defined as hind foot a deduction. As we continue our discussion of the ankle and foot joints, the next uh, area that we want to discuss um, are the ligaments that would compose kind of this subtalar uh, joint. Um, First, we find the medial talocalcaneal ligament. Uh, this is going to connect the medial tubercle of the kind of posterior portion of the talus with the back of the sustentaculum tali that we find on the calcaneus. It limits this anterior translation of the talus as well as limiting eversion of the calcaneus. Uh, we also here find the lateral talocalcaneal ligament and the inner osseous ligament of which we find a posterior and anterior band. Collectively, then this anterior, uh, or excuse me, this inner osseous ligament uh, stabilizes the subtalar joint. Now these these ligaments are fairly um, uh, uh, statically stable and so outside of a global laxity issue um, that we may we may come into contact with uh, the subtalar joint is a fairly stable joint for most individuals and so um, this is an area to definitely take uh, into consideration. Uh, unfortunately, though, in the past, uh, physical therapists, um, osteopaths, even podiatrists and others have really kind of been overzealous in their interpretation of subtalar joint motion. And again, this is something that we'll dive further into as we get into the objective exam. Now we're going to move uh, more distally. Uh, we find the mid-tarsal joint complex at this point. Uh, the mid-tarsal joints are called Chopars or Chopers, uh, depending upon your pronunciation joints, uh, consist of the talonavicular joint as well as the calcaneocuboid joints. Uh, the open pack position for these is going to be somewhere between supination and pronation, so similar to what we saw with the subtalar joint. Uh, and the closed pack position would be maximum supination, which again is similar to the subtalar joint. It is here that we find these two separate joint axes known as the LMJA and the OMJA. The LMJA is the longitudinal mid-tarsal joint axis, and then we find the oblique mid-tarsal joint axis. Uh, for the longitudinal uh, axis, this is primarily the talonavicular joint. Okay, And so the primary motion that we're going to see here would be inversion and eversion. So you can appreciate uh, the, the two uh, illustrations to the right, uh, the two being the LMJA and OMJA, kind of look like chopsticks, but it essentially is the uh, center of the axis of rotation. And so you can appreciate for the LMJA how if that is passing through the posterior calcaneus, um, up and through uh, the navicular joint um, and kind of the first ray, this would be where we would find our inversion and eversion rotating medial lateral around that axis. If we look at the oblique um, mid tarsal joint axis, this is running really from the lateral aspect of the calcaneus really straight out. Um, through the calcaneocuboid joint, kind of running almost in parallel with it, um, and then out the top of the talus. Uh, the primary motion that we would see here is dorsiflexion, 
as well as plant reflection. Now there is a component motion here of E version and E version. Um, so again, dorsiflexion would be paired with E version, plant reflection with inversion, um, and that would be uh, consistent with what we saw earlier where dorsiflexion is paired more with a pronation, plantar flexion is paired more with supination. So that theme is consistent um, throughout. So then as we consider these mid-tarsal joints, um, we have a couple ligaments uh, at play here. First and foremost is the talonavicular ligament. Uh, the dorsal surface of the neck of the talus to the navicular and then um, uh, it's going to help to stabilize the talonavicular joint. Its main role is to limit plantar flexion as well as inversion of the navicular. Okay. The second one that we see here is the bifurcate ligament. Um, it's hard to visualize on this um, uh, specific image, uh, but we have two portions. We have a medial and a lateral portion, and again, it's going to serve to limit plantar flexion, uh, both of the navicular as well as the cuboid. If we keep going, we're going to find our plantar calcaneonavicular ligament. Um, this is also commonly referred to as the spring ligament, and it connects the navicular to the sustentaculum tali. It functions as a ligament, a sling from the head of the talus, uh, and then becoming taut during pronation. The reason why this gets so much attention is um, it's thought that this is a ligament that is lax uh, for an individual that overpronates or adopts more of a pes planus. Uh, posture of the foot uh, during kind of loading response into terminal stance and um, so when uh, assessing the foot and ankle this area again kind of gets a lot of attention and and um, focus during the clinical examination. As I mentioned earlier with the subtalar joint, we're probably being a little bit overzealous in, in terms of that. The body is remarkably adaptable and robust, and to think that one um, lax or uh, stretched kind of static stabilizer is accounting for all of the problems with the foot and ankle is probably a little bit um, uh, too minimalistic uh, of a viewpoint. Um, we need to instead kind of look at the interaction of multiple segments and multiple joints and take into account the kinematic chain as a whole. We see a few other ligaments here. Um, long and short plantar ligaments as we move to the more plantar aspect of the foot, but still at the mid-tarsal joint. We see the long plantar ligament. This is a rather broad base ligament that forms a tunnel for peroneal longus tendon um, and helps to also compress the calcaneal cuboid joint. We also uh, could visualize the short plantar ligament, but it is deep to the long plantar ligament, so we would have to dissect that and reflect that back. Um, there's just a little bit, bit of it kind of peeking out right underneath the long plantar ligament. It does the same thing. It compresses the calcaneal cuboid joint, um, but again is deep uh, to our long plantar ligament. As we move now from the hind foot to the midfoot, uh, mid tarsals. Now we're into the inner tarsal joints. Uh, here we find the cuneo navicular, the inner cuneiform, cuneo cuboid, and cubo navicular joint. All really big mouthfuls, right? Um, and uh, these inner tarsal joints uh, function to uh, really transmit force from the hind foot to the forefoot. And uh, this is also where we're going to find some of our, our arches. Uh, and we'll talk about that momentarily. However, before we do that, we need to recognize that there are some ligaments that kind of hold all of these uh, inner tarsal joints together. And so uh, when we look at this on the medial aspect, uh, just uh, distal really to the navicular into the medial cuneiforms, we find the Liz Franck joint complex. And this consists of the cuneo metatarsal joints, the cubo metatarsal joints, and then the inner metatarsal joints. And in this region, uh, we have what's known as the Liz Franck ligament, which is a solitary interosseous ligament. It's on the plantar surface of the midfoot. Uh, really between the head of the second metatarsal and the medial cuneiform, and it confers this stability then across the Liz Franck joint, which is an area that gets a lot of attention because of the degree of pronation that would uh, be occurring through this uh, area. 
Uh, note that um, if we kind of were to look at this region, that being our uh, medial, intermediate, and lateral cuneiforms, as well as our, our, our most lateral bone of the intermetatarsals, that being the cuboid, we would see kind of this arch. And so the intermediate or middle cuneiform really acts as the keystone that supports the arch uh, on either side. Here you can visualize the Liz Franck ligament a little bit better. Um, you see the dorsal layer um, in, in grouping A, that would be from the dorsal side. You see kind of the interosseous layer, that would be B, and then finally the plantar layer, which is what you would see in C. So it just kind of gives you a, a, a helpful illustration of kind of moving from more of a, of a superior to inferior um, angulation. So now we're finally into the forefoot joints. Um, these are the joints of the metatarsals uh, into the phalanges. Um, the first ray is really an area that we're going to spend a fair amount of time assessing and, and focusing on because um, of a variety of reasons that will become apparent shortly. But the first ray, um, first we must realize, is comprised of the first metatarsal. It is considered to be um, part of the medial cuneiform as well as the navicular. And so motion is going to occur in two planes simultaneously both with regards to dorsiflexion and inversion and then plantar flexion and eversion okay um, and these are these are, are more discussed in terms of inversion and eversion than with regards to supination and pronation even though those are likely to be uh, component motions as well but um, we want to we want to be clear with our nomenclature here that it's dorsiflexion and inversion plantar flexion and eversion okay the first MTP joint, MTP would be the metatarsal phalangeal joint, does serve to increase the lever for flexion of the first MTP. And under normal gait considerations, um, the MTP ligamentous complex must withstand 40 to 60% of body weight. And so this gets a fair amount of attention. Um, and if uh, an individual is participating in athletic activity, that can go up significantly. We can see it go as high as eight times body weight. And so the first right is really, really, really important in terms of um, uh, not only your assessment, but also maintaining function uh, and, and um, uh, overall use of the foot and ankle, specifically the forefoot. The fifth ray is also really important. Uh, it's comprised of the cuboid as well as the fifth metatarsal extending all the way proximal to the fifth met head. Motion is occurring in two planes simultaneously here uh, to include dorsiflexion and eversion as well as plantar flexion and inversion. So note, it switches, right? When we're looking at the first ray, dorsiflexion and inversion are paired. When we move to the fifth ray, they switch. Dorsiflexion and eversion are paired, okay? And it's because of this that the forefoot really helps to accommodate to uneven terrain and can be so dynamic in terms of assisting with balance and overall stance stability. Uh, we can also start to appreciate some of the different uh, foot postures uh, that would be um, kind of accounted for or even morphological differences. These are accounted for through the forefoot and so we can see more of a rounded posture, more of a square, and then even more of what's known as a Morton where it's almost kind of like the peak on a house. We absolutely have to talk about the plantar fascia. Um, uh, and specifically how it relates to the first ray. Uh, as you get out into clinical practice, you will note a, a fair amount of pathology uh, occurring through the foot and ankle, and it seems to kind of find its root within the plantar fascia. We'll talk more about that as we get into some of our objective exam, but first we should realize that the plantar fascia is this tough kind of fibrous layer consisting of uh, type one and three collagen fibers and these elastic fibers. It's incredibly strong. Uh, the idea that we can load this to failure is estimated to be in excess of a thousand newtons um, and so this is not something that's likely to to rupture now uh, one area where this would be the exception and this often does occur is if an individual is utilizing a corticosteroid to manage inflammation uh, due to a plantar fasciopathy that can lead to um, a diminished capacity for load uh, through these fibers and it is then um, seen and um, clinically possible that an individual if they are loading it in a very dynamic way could rupture the plantar fascia. There are three major areas. We see the central portion, 
as well as a lateral and more medial portion. And the reason why we need to talk about this as it relates to the first ray is due to the biomechanical function. And so uh, you may recall from anatomy and physiology, there's two things that are going on here. One is there's a truss system that's built. You have this stabilization of two struts um, that really kind of span out and they limit the ability of the, the, the struts to spread out. With that though, you also then find this windlass mechanism. And the windlass mechanism is really, really crucial in order to propel the individual forward during the toe off portion of gait. And so if we look at the windlass mechanism, this is what it, this is what it would resemble. We see the trusses, all right, and so we would have the two trusses. Uh, one truss would kind of span from the hind foot calcaneus into the talus. The second uh, uh, truss would span from kind of our um, inner tarsal joints down through the metatarsals uh, and into the metatarsal phalangeal joint. As the first ray moves into an extended uh, posture, right, um, or a more dorsiflex posture. What we see is um, the truss uh, kind of raising up, the, so the arch height increases. And what this does is it increases the overall stability of the foot. And so this is one of the ways in which the foot can really kind of hold this paradoxical function. At the very beginning, remember we said the role of the foot and ankle is to function as a very mobile um, uh, uh, surface, if you will, uh, accommodating and adapting to variable terrain, but then to also serve as a very rigid lever. Well, this is how that happens. Uh, when the first ray is in more of a plantar flexed or neutral position, the foot uh, arches can be a little bit lower and they can be a little bit more accommodating to variable terrain. As you move into a dorsiflexed or extended position, the arch raises up, it increases foot stability, and it provides this very, very nice rigid letter lever that helps then with forward propulsion. If we now consider some of the other anatomy, um, we would be remiss to not include the superior extensor retinaculum. Uh, this is uh, more proximal to the uh, Taylor curl joint, foot and ankle complex as a whole. Um, it would be uh, in and around the distal tib fib joint, and it's a really crucial uh, thickening of the deep fascia, uh, spanning really from the tibia to the fibula. And the reason why it's so crucial is it prevents um, the tendons from bowstringing. So it serves to cover and kind of hold down the tendons of that anterior compartment of the leg. And what this does then is it provides um, an increased lever uh, by which the line of pull is maintained for those tendons because a lot of the tendons uh, of the foot have their muscle belly uh, within the anterior, uh, medial lateral and posterior leg. And so these muscles are acting at a distance. This retinaculum, and we have an inferior extensor retinaculum as well, really serves to provide line of pull and maintain uh, the biomechanical properties of these structures. We mentioned earlier that we um, need to consider the transverse uh, arches of both the tarsal and the metatarsal region. Uh, here we see um, the cuboid, the lateral, um, uh, intermediate and medial uh, cuneiforms, and then um, our various uh, metatarsal heads. And so this would be spanning from the first to the fifth uh, side. Combine these make up the transverse tarsal arch as well as the transverse metatarsal arch. Um, this would be looking kind of with an axis uh, straight through the foot. If we look from more of a medial uh, viewpoint, we can visualize uh, the transverse arch um, as well as the medial longitudinal arch and the lateral longitudinal arch. So the longitudinal arches then are really extending from the hind foot all the way to the forefoot, whereas our transverse arch is composed of what we saw earlier, that being the transverse tarsal and the transverse metatarsal arch. Let's now consider the medial longitudinal arch. There's a couple different um, uh, 
structures that are important for this medial longitudinal arch. And maintaining it is often an area of great uh, focus uh, because the medial longitudinal arch typically um, is where we see more of a flattening out in an individual that has a, a good degree of pronation. The bones here are, are on the medial side, so it's the calcaneus and talus, the navicular, our cuneiforms, and then our medial metatarsals, first, second, and third. The keystone of this arch is the head of the talus. And so when we think of the keystone, visualize kind of an archway where the keystone is helping to support um, both the, uh, uh, in this case, more hind foot to forefoot, but when we're considering an arch, both the, the more uh, right and left side of the arch. This is maintained by a number of muscles. Uh, we see the flexor digitorum brevis here, the adductor hallucis, uh, as well as some tendons and ligaments that we've already discussed. And so um, it has both static and dynamic stabilizers uh, for this arch. As we move to the lateral side, we see the lateral longitudinal arch. Um, and here we would consider the bones on the more lateral side. So this is the calcaneus and cuboid as well as our fourth and fifth metatarsal. In this case, the cuboid acts as the keystone. And that's really important um, because uh, we can have some calcaneal cuboid uh, dysfunction. Um, we're going to discuss a manipulation um, uh, known as the cuboid whip uh, that can uh, kind of better align the cuboid uh, if there is a pathology there. And the reason why we would do that is to maintain that lateral longitudinal arch. Um, this arch is more stable and less adjustable than the medial one. The medial one has more adjustability and mobility to, again, kind of accommodate to variable terrain. Again, just like we saw on the medial side, there are a variety of both static and dynamic stabilizers. So static, those being the ligaments, dynamic, those being our contractile structures of muscles and tendons. And so here we see the adductor digiti minimi and flexor digitorum brevis, as well as our peroneal muscles, peroneus longus and brevis, um, even tertius as well. Finally, we look at our transverse arches. Um, and so with our transverse arches, uh, these would be um, our um, uh, both metatarsal and intertarsal transverse arches. Uh, and so these are our metatarsal and intertarsal uh, bones. Uh, the keystone here is the intermediate or middle cuneiform. And uh, then we see our intertarsal joints that are maintained then by a whole bunch of muscles, tendons, and ligaments. A helpful way to kind of conceptualize then the foot and ankle is that there are really these three weight bearing areas in the foot. Two are in the ball of the foot, so the more distal foot on the plantar aspect, and then one at the heel. None of these weight bearing areas completely receives the entire weight of the body when we stand. Rather, we can think of the foot as really a three legged tripod or platform. If you think of a three-legged platform or tripod, it's typically a very stable structure um, to varying um, uh, kind of perturbation, uh, maybe we, we might consider it that way, or to forces. Uh, and so in this case, we're not standing on just one of the edges, but really there's a balance that exists between all the supporting structures. And so as such, the foot and ankle is very, very good at supporting and bearing this weight. And this is also why um, it is uh, very appropriate to serve to attenuate force. As we wrap up then our discussion of our overview of general anatomy, kinesiology, and biomechanics, we would do well to consider some of the neuromuscular components. Uh, there are uh, more superficial and deep layers here, um, things that uh, we may want to look at uh, more in depth, and, and I would encourage you to review uh, past anatomy notes on, would be things uh, that are kind of bolded here. Uh, things like our abductor digiti minimi, our flexor digiti minimi, um, abductor hallucis, um, uh, which is both the muscle and the tendon in this um, image, and then also things uh, like our deeper layer, which would be where we would find our quadratus plantae, uh, that oftentimes can be implicated in plantar fasciopathies, um, and so being aware of, of that as well. Um, 
here we can also visualize the superficial and deep branch of the plantar nerve. Uh, you need to be mindful of that specifically if clinically you would ever consider uh, utilizing therapeutic dry needling or any other form of invasive technique because that nerve um, has a, a, a very sensitive role in terms of the plantar aspect and can be um, uh, kind of driving some of the pain responses. If we look to more of the um, uh, kind of dorsal view, we can see some of the dorsal interosseous and then the plantar view, some more of those dorsal interosseous. Also, you can begin to appreciate all of the intertarsal ligaments um, and some of the, the ligaments that we discussed earlier, like the long plantar, short plantar, the plantar calcaneonavicular ligament, otherwise known as the spring ligament. So it just helps to kind of pull all of this together. And finally, as we wrap up, uh, this gives us a good appreciation for some of the different uh, neurologic structures of the foot. So as we move from kind of the posterior foot, here we find innervation from the tib tibial nerve. Um, this would be uh, root levels L4 and 5 to S1 and 2. Uh, the heel is primarily uh, medial calcaneal branches of the tibial nerve, root levels S1 and 2. We then have both medial and lateral plantar nerves um, that we just discussed. And then the saphenous nerve is also implicated here, which is L3 and 4. Um, so being mindful of that um, as well. Uh, you can visualize some of this as it uh, courses through kind of the posterior aspect. Uh, we see the decusation just proximal to the popliteal fossa uh, with the tibial nerve. That is going to split um, and, and kind of continue down uh, through the posterior aspect of uh, the tricep sura. And then that split or, or, or kind of decusation uh, is where we get the common fibular nerve that dives just posterior to the fibular head and will innervate our peroneal muscles. And then as we get down into the foot and ankle, um, becomes uh, kind of a portion of um, our sural nerve. We have our lateral calcaneal branch, medial calcaneal branches that are going to provide sensory distribution to the plantar aspect of our foot. And then uh, we can also see on the more antero uh, lateral portion here, our cutaneous innervation. And so this is where we get lateral sural and superficial fibular peroneal nerves, as well as our deep fibular or peroneal nerve. And those are going to be important in terms of our peripheral uh, sensory uh, testing when we get to objective exam. It's really important that we do a thorough job assessing the integrity of the neurologic system. Many of the patients that we see are coming to us with pathologies that implicate the neurovascular system, um, diabetes being a, a, a big one. And so being able to take a very thorough uh, sensory distribution exam uh, and, and determine then if there is a deficit is really important in terms of clinical examination. So uh, with that, we're going to wrap up our overview of anatomy, uh, kinesiology, and biomechanics. Um, a lot of this information will be brought together uh, in more of a, a synthesized uh, application fashion as we move into subjective and objective examination, and then ultimately um, as we move into differential diagnosis. So thanks for watching, and stay tuned for more to come.